This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome members of our armed forces who are tuning in from outposts around the world. Thank you for being with us again. My guest today is former United States Senator and Governor of California, Mr. Pete Wilson. He'll be joining us in just a moment to talk about the next round of partisan wrangling over raising the budget ceiling, which is going to start back up in January, and what measures Washington must take to put the country on the path to fiscal health. But before Mr. Wilson explains how he turned one of the worst economies in California around, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little bit about his background. Peter Barton Wilson was born in a suburb of Chicago and moved to St. Louis, Missouri when he was a junior in high school. He received his undergraduate degree from Yale University. After graduating, Wilson served in the United States Marine Corps as an infantry officer and platoon leader. And following his service in the Marine Corps, Wilson earned his law degree from the University of California at Berkeley. Wilson became a criminal defense attorney but found it difficult to defend clients who he claimed were, for the most part, guilty. So he quickly changed his practice to address general law issues. By 1968, Wilson was elected to the California State Assembly and then also re-elected. By this time, the young Wilson was ready to take on a bigger challenge, and in 1971, he ran for and was elected mayor of San Diego. In fact, Wilson proved to be such a successful and popular mayor of California's second largest city. This propelled him to the U.S. Senate, a seat he won in 1982 against outgoing Governor Jerry Brown. While Senator Wilson supported the Federal Intergovernmental Regulatory Relief Act, which requires the federal government to reimburse states for new federal mandates, something we're going to talk about a little later in today's program. Wilson also earned the nickname the Watchdog of the Treasury for his conservative stance on spending. In 1990, Wilson campaigned for governor of California and successfully defeated San Francisco Mayor Dianne Feinstein. Unfortunately, many thought Feinstein emerged the real victor, In spite of losing the election, the fact was Wilson inherited the worst economy since the Great Depression, and the state was sinking fast. California faced a $14 billion budget deficit, along with sharply rising demand for social services. Against this backdrop, Wilson achieved the seemingly impossible. He turned the deficit to a surplus by the time he left office. But he was criticized by the right for raising taxes and attacked by the left for his aggressive immigration reform. And you've heard me state this more than once on the program. The most dangerous position any politician can take in the United States is to step away from partisanship and focus on getting real work done. In 1999, Wilson left office and returned to the commercial sector, working in merchant banking and as a consultant. He is presently part of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and the law firm of Bingham McCutcheon. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report one of our country's most experienced fiscal stewards, Mr. Pete Wilson. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Wilson. Well, thank you, Rebecca. It's my pleasure. Uh, If it's okay with you... Uh, Today, I I just wanted to jump right into this next round of arguing over whether to raise the debt ceiling, which is about ready to hit all of us in January. Let let me ask you, are are we likely to see another government shutdown in 2014? Because as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem as though anything's been done uh, in the time that we bought. Well, I I would have to say that I think that's probably true. Uh, I don't think... Either side is eager for a shutdown. I don't think they were the last time. There is a a genuine, uh, mostly honest disagreement that uh, simply could not find resolution. And on the one hand, you had those who were opposed to Obamacare, uh, and it was very clear. The lines were could not have been clearer. There was not a Republican vote in either house at any time for any part of Obamacare so that it was an entirely democratic project and entirely uh, one that was very clearly made the signature achievement of President Obama. And the efforts to reach some kind of compromise, frankly, were rejected. Uh, 
there are people who say, well, there, what's the Republican program? Well, there is one, but every time that it was offered, it was rejected. And I think we've seen in recent days in this uh, month-long campaign to sell Obamacare that the president is very stubbornly uh, asserting that uh, as long as he is president, there will be no change in it, and therefore all the all the flack that he has taken, uh, not only on the website, but really much more important on the basic conflict that is inherent in the legislation, has not dissuaded him from pursuing it with a single-mindedness that is very worrisome to the people in his party who are seeking re-election in 2014. So are we just going to see round two again at the beginning of next year? I mean, it's it's going to be the same standoff over Obamacare, isn't it? Well, it, that may well be. I don't think you will see an effort to defund it, but I do think that you will see uh, ongoing opposition, and I think you will see ongoing defense by the administration. But it's very clear from the people who have been trooping down to the White House, especially those from the Senate, that they are in deathly uh, fear that Obamacare is going to cost them their seats. So let me ask you, are we going to raise the debt ceiling again? I think that we will raise the debt ceiling, but there is clearly need for the kind of mechanism that will avoid the problem of having to simply recognize that we've been profligate and honoring the uh, the debts, that is, that is just guaranteed for us to continue the growth in the size and cost of government. But and, I don't, but we can't just continue on this. Pro- I mean, you of all people would not condone raising the debt ceiling every six months. Well, I don't. That's not even in your DNA. (laughs) But No, that's right. But you have to recognize that the reason that it arises as a requirement is because there is no end to the spending on the part of the majority. So what what kind of emergency measures can either the Republican or Democratic Party, let's not make this about any particular party, what kind of emergency (laughs) measures could they do in the next 30 or 60 days to prevent us from having to raise the debt ceiling. Is there anything? What they have tried in the past, as you are aware, with uh, mixed consequences and mixed support and opposition, is the sequester. And Mm. that is uh, painful, particularly when the act falls not uh, equitably across the boards in an even, even fashion, but when the majority of the cuts are taken uh, in disproportionate measure to military spending and, and preparedness, uh, particularly at a time when we are facing very real, uh, not just threats, but the kind of foreign policy decisions that have, I think, weakened the impression of both our allies and our enemies and caused the kind of provocative actions that we're now seeing on the part of the Chinese. So I take it you would not be uh, in favor of sequestration? I would prefer it, frankly, to continuing to simply spend beyond our ability uh, to handle the debt. Mm -hmm. And we have already uh, compiled a mountain of debt for our children and our grandchildren. You bet. And the great concern that I think most responsible people have in both parties is that one day it may result in the kind of touching off the kind of runaway inflation, yeah. uh, which could, I mean, just be catastrophic. Yeah, that's definitely a concern. And we have to take our first commercial break. When we come back, we're going to find out more about the lessons we can learn from the turnaround of the California economy. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? 
This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data, and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile, and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM Big Data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. Well, the holidays are upon us, and that means the festivities are officially underway. So here's a tip guaranteed to make a splash at every party and put a smile on every hostess. Pick up a bottle of Caraccioli Pinot Noir Chardonnay Brut or Brut Rosé. Grown, perfected, and bottled by the Caraccioli family, these old-school premium wines are one of the best-kept secrets among wine aficionados. But trust me, the secret's getting out fast. So grab a bottle while these wines are still affordable. Go to CaracciolieCellars.com or stop by their tasting room on Dolores and Ocean Avenue in downtown Carmel and pick up a bottle of Caraccioli Premium Wines and bring a little bling to the holidays. A few years ago, I noticed I was feeling increasingly tired. My fatigue was so intense that I got to the point sometimes when I got home from work, I couldn't even remember the drive. The excessive tiredness and forgetfulness, not to mention my snoring, that constantly woke up my husband prompted me to get a sleep test. The results showed that I have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a common disorder. In fact, 50 to 60% of those who snore have it. Many couples accept snoring as an inevitable part of nightly life, but sleep apnea is associated with serious health problems, such as the risk of high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, and even heart failure. Treatments for sleep apnea range from simple lifestyle changes to breathing machines to surgery. Treating my sleep apnea has changed my life. Armed with information, you too could be on your way to a restful night's sleep and a healthier life. Learn more at wakeuptosleep.org or call 877-389-8868. There's just one place where students are students first and athletics are played with purpose and perspective. There's just one place where a team is more than a group of individual agendas. It's a catalyst for demonstrating the potential of the collaborative spirit. There's just one place where players, coaches, and fans experience the exhilaration that happens when an entire community rallies behind the school team. That place is your local high school. High school sports offer more than the joy of competition. Studies show that student athletes are more likely to enjoy greater levels of achievement in other areas of their lives, including academics. In addition, high school sports help young people in California develop the discipline and confidence they need to be leaders in life, even as they unite communities like nothing else. High school sports, a winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. Got a comment or a question? Visit Rebecca Costa's comments page at RebeccaCosta.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is former United States Senator and Governor of California, Mr. Pete Wilson. And before the break, we were talking about the options the nation may face early next year, which you point out may be sequestration or raising the budget ceiling. But as you were saying, sequestration comes with it, some exposure regarding national security, and yet continuing to raise the debt ceiling is likely at some point to trigger hyperinflation, which our children and grandchildren will pay for. So it sounds like we're in for some tough decisions. Is that right? Yes, I think that it's uh, inescapable. We'll have to make tough decisions, but it shouldn't be that difficult, really. I mean, recently the... uh, The Reagan Library was host to a National Defense Forum, uh, and they invited as guests the current Secretary of Defense, Secretary Hagel, 
mm-hmm. and his two predecessors, Leon Panetta of California and, and Robert Gates. Uh, every speaker that day, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the uh, the the other Joint Chiefs, the Chief of Naval Operations, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, all of these very high-powered officials bemoaned the sequestration and the impact that it was having upon readiness of our military. And I join in that. The problem, though, is that the sequestration, this is what I meant when I said that the sequestration produced cuts that were not across the boards. Mm -hmm. It fell disproportionately upon national security, and that is a serious mistake. And I think it has, in fact, invited an impression of weakness on our part uh, and weakness in terms of resolve. I think that and the president's performance on Syria, uh, I think his earlier backing down from our missile defense commitments to our Polish and Czech allies, all of these things have sent a very unfortunate message. But the point really is sequestration uh, really means that we're going to cut spending and not simply continue to spend at a rate and then raise the debt ceiling to legitimize it that leads to this mountain of debt that's ever increasing. And with the kind of monetary policy that is producing uh, endless quantitative easing, which just means increasing the money supply, right? there is a very real danger of inflation well, I would imagine so. If our if our whole fiscal policy is just print more money, it's a, well, <laughs> I mean that right, that seems it? to be the only policy we have. I, maybe I have it wrong. Well, thank God, states can't do that, and uh, we couldn't when I was. Well, maybe the states ought to be allowed to. Why not? No, no, well, you well, don't just... want that. Believe me, <laughs> you don't want that. No, well, well, well let, to... me, let me move the discussion along a little bit because, you know, you are responsible for one of the most historic turnarounds in any state. Uh, not, but, but to do that, in addition to raising taxes, which you went against your own party to do, you also made some very unpopular decisions on, on cutting spending, particularly in California, which was one of the first states to attempt to bar illegal immigrants from receiving free social services. Uh, so uh, I, I want to ask you, let, like, let's take that model. And let's apply it on the federal level. What do we need to do? Well, you need to force an agreement. And the agreement that we reached uh, was one that was truly a compromise, which I found extremely distasteful. What happened was that I inherited uh, a deficit. The revenue gap, when I came to office, amounted to one-third of the entire state general fund. It had begun undetected in May of the election year, but not really was it discovered in anything like its magnitude until very late, actually after the election. Mm -hmm. And so four days after I had been sworn in, I submitted a budget that cut $7 billion in spending, from a budget that was not quite 43. Now, you didn't expect that to win you any popularity contest. No, I knew it wouldn't. But what happened is that as time wore on, the $7 billion became larger. And by the time that we had reached late spring, mm-hmm. it was well over $10 billion and on its way to being 14 plus. Mm-hmm. And at that point, the Democratic leadership said, We are no longer laughing, declaring your budget dead on arrival. We hate those cuts. We will agree to take them. But that's as far as we can go. And the rest, either run a deficit or increase taxes. Well, neither of those were acceptable to me, but uh, one was even less acceptable, and that was the deficit that they were perfectly willing to run. And I had to remind them that it was a violation of the state constitution to do so. And if it had not been in the constitution, I wouldn't have permitted it anyway, because there is something at the state level, at least, which is even more distasteful than a temporary, and I do mean temporary, increase in taxes uh, 
which is what we wound up doing with Republican votes. Uh, and it took some courage on their part. But in order to avoid that, we would have had to cut the only thing we hadn't cut, and that was education K through 12, mm -hmm. which was already, frankly, liberally spent, uh, liberally financed, as it always has been, and certainly in modern times, without uh, a statutory guarantee that was put in place by the initiative process which guaranteed a certain level of funding depending upon revenue levels. Mm -hmm. So the net of it was that we did increase taxes uh, to do half, to fill half the gap. And it was by operation of law that they came off within two to three years. And at the same time, we made the kind of changes to change the image of California from being indifferent or even hostile to investment and job creation to a place that welcomed jobs and wanted to collaborate with communities large and small to bring jobs to California. But we have that problem now on a federal level. We still have the same two levers. We can either raise taxes or cut expenses, and we're likely going to have to follow the way of Australia and other countries. We're going to probably have to do both. So what's the holdup if we all know that? Well, the, the holdup in my case was that I threatened to veto anything that was not in balance, and it worked. Uh, they did not want to spend the rest of their lives in Sacramento, particularly in an election year, the second year I was in office, but they actually pushed it pretty hard. We went 64 days past the constitutional deadline. Yes, I remember and, that. I'm, I'm and, old enough to remember those days. And I said... Uh, <laughs> My friends, you need to understand that uh, if you are going to be intransigent about doing what you should, you should make your Christmas dinner reservations across the street because we will still be here. And uh, the point was finally made. After the first two years, they agreed that we should try to do something more sensible. Well, I, I like that style. It was, it was tough going, but you didn't blink. And uh, maybe that's what we need in a leader to say, you know, don't put anything that isn't going to make mathematical sense across my desk. Uh, we have to take another short break. Uh, when we come back, we'll be, we'll be uh, continuing our conversation with Pete Wilson. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations, that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Did you know that thousands of children in their families depend on the Boys and Girls Clubs every day? We provide nutritious meals, mentoring, academic support, scholarships, and so much more to ensure the children in Monterey County are prepared for great futures. Hello, my name is Donna Ferraro, CEO and President of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Monterey County. Today, I am on a mission because so many children depend on us. I am asking our entire community to help meet the need. Will you help? Your gift of $10 will feed five children a healthy after-school meal. Be part of creating great futures for our kids. Visit us online at bgcmc.org slash give. Or give us a call at 831-394-5171. Please, give today and make your investment count for a lifetime. Boys and girls of Monterey County and I, thank you for your support. Hello, I'm Ben Vereen. You probably know me for my singing, acting, and dancing on Broadway, 
television and the big screen, but what you may not know about me is that I'm one of the 26 million Americans living with diabetes. My doctor diagnosed me four years ago. But now, with my blood sugar levels under control, I've been blessed to continue to do what I love to do, perform, and not let this disease, type 2 diabetes, hold me back. In fact, I've taken a stand for my diabetes. And I'm asking those of you with diabetes and those who love them to take this stand with me. Talk to your doctor today and visit StandForDiabetes.org to learn more. That's StandForDiabetes.org. A public service of taking control of your diabetes made possible with support from Santa Fe U.S. Remember, if you have diabetes, it doesn't have to hold you back. Victor Ray, this is Scorpion 23 traveling west on MSR Vernon. Four Victor, 16 packs. Request MSR status over. Roger. Scorpion 23, all MSRs and AOR red past 24 hours. Three IEDs on MSR Vernon. IED, In war, there will always be casualties. And for our wounded warriors, coming home can sometimes be a battle in itself. American troops who suffer traumatic injuries need the support of every American. Join us and send your message of support to our wounded warriors and their families at USO.org. The USO, until everyone comes home. Join Rebecca Costa right now on Facebook. Search Facebook.com forward slash Rebecca Costa. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is Pete Wilson. And before we went to break, um, you were pointing out that uh, when you became governor of California, there was a bit of a hostile attitude toward uh, business and and uh, changing that image was an important part of restoring California's fiscal health. So continuing along those lines, when the economy is growing and people are working, well, taxes naturally go up. So we have to put folks back to work in high-paying jobs again. Uh, my question to you is, what do you think the current administration should do to stimulate job growth? You mean the federal administration? Sure. Well, I think there are a number of things they could do. I think that tax policies uh, are a part of it, just as they are at the state level. I think that uh, regulatory excess is a is a terrible hidden tax. I'll give you one example very near at hand, mm -hmm. uh, and that is Dodd-Frank was uh, uh, the other piece of legislation after Obamacare that uh, the Congress produced with the administration's backing, it has the potential to shut down uh, any number of literally thousands of small banks across the country, and it is the community banks that finance half the small business loans in the country. And small business is the great job generator, the great employer, not just in California, but all across the country. For our listeners today who are not familiar with Dodd-Frank, how would that affect the smaller banks? Well, what it, it does is produce 400 new requirements that was result in about 5,000 pages in the Federal Register. And the cost of compliance mm -hmm. with these is phenomenal. Uh, the big banks can, uh, can afford it. The small banks literally cannot. There have already been a number shut down. There are more that are predicted uh, to go out of business and or be absorbed by bigger banks. Do you get a sense that regulations and complexity in general are being used to squeeze out the small uh, business and, and even individuals? I mean, our, our uh, personal tax code is, what, 75,000 pages now? I mean, yeah. that's just overwhelming. What chance does the person who's self-filing have? Well, you're absolutely right. The answer to your question is yes. And whether it is intended, that's the effect. And at the state level, it's driving people out of California, driving companies and employers out of California. 
And that is, it's not a luxury, but it's a, a practice that we cannot afford. Now, I've never seen bureaucracies go backwards. Have you? Sadly, <laughs> very, very few. A few have, but not many. And that's a function, frankly, of the fact that the probably the consistent major financier of the growth of government are the public employee unions in this country. That's certainly true in California, but it's by no means limited to California. It's at every level. It's federal, state, and local. And unlike private sector unions who are compelled to take into account the realities of their employer's ability to survive in the marketplace, Mm -hmm. that's not true of the public employee unions. The government worker unions The bosses of those unions figure there's always more where that came from, from Mm -hmm. the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And sadly, what that has produced time and again is new bureaucracy. And we've seen a steady decline in private sector union membership while explosions in the population of the government worker union. Mm, that's interesting. And, you know, that kind of antagonistic union boss relationship existed in the automotive industry until uh, they were on their knees. And then that, that changed everything. Uh, maybe that has to happen here. Well, it, it, it needs to happen for a lot of reasons. Uh, and one of the reasons that you've seen this sort of meteoric uh, explosion in the size and cost of government is because it feeds the needs of the bosses, Mm -hmm. and how does it do that? Well, in California, for example, and in a number of other states, I think in half the states, state law requires that if you want to go to work for the state or for a local government, you have to join a union, and by law, that union can take from your paycheck what are supposed to be dues to compensate them for the cost of conducting collective bargaining. That's nonsense, because that's peanuts. Mm-hmm. What they're doing is taking a much bigger chunk than is required, and the rest of it goes to build a political war chest in which the people who have earned the money, the dues-paying union members, have zero say. It is decided by the bosses, and frankly, they go for people who are liberals. They go for people who are willing to listen and be beholden for the support they get in putting them in office, and that's what's happened. Now, how do you dismantle something that's as big a systemic problem as that? You should change the law. That's the way to do it. And uh, we've tried three times in California by the initiative process. Every time we have been massively outspent. By the unions. By the public employee unions who have put on the air television spots that are totally false and misrepresent what is actually at issue. But, you know, when you're outspent that by that much uh, and you've got a, a gullible public who are not paying close attention, who think that what they see in a 30-second spot is, is true, it's, uh, we've come close. We actually came closest the very first time we tried it in my administration. But I think maybe the courts will finally come to the conclusion that this is a violation of the First Amendment rights of dues-paying members of those unions, both public and private, Mm -hmm. whose money is being taken from their checks for political purposes without their consent. I never understood why unions can't be voluntary. If you're doing a good job for me, representing me, protecting me, you know, from being exploited, then I would want to join you. Right? I mean, doesn't it make logical sense that you would want to be part of an organization from which you benefit? Yes, but if they are supporting Why why does it have to be mandatory? Am I missing something? (laughs) Well, I don't think so. But uh, where it is voluntary, uh, there are uh, half the states, it is voluntary. Mm Mm-hmm. And they seem to function pretty well. And, in fact, most of those states, which are red states for the most part, uh, they are doing pretty well in job creation and in revenue production with far lower taxes than the blue states. When you look at the big states, California, New York, Illinois, 
although we've seen some remarkable things. If you had told me a year ago mm-hmm. that Michigan would become a right-to-work state, <laughs> I would have said, what are you smoking? Yeah, that's right. But that is that is uh, not just an incidental consideration. And it has fueled the growth in the size and cost of federal government, state government, and local government. Mm-hmm. And then that, in turn, adds more regulation, adds more complexity. And then what we don't understand is that there's sort of a backfire effect. The more regu- There, very, yeah, there very definitely is. Absolutely. I mean, just think of this. This, this bill has created, by the way, a brand-new bureaucracy at the federal level. The Dodd-Frank bill created what is called the Consumer Protection or Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Mm-hmm. And guess what they will be up to? Among other things, they will be pressing other federal agencies that will control setting the rates for mortgages to ease them so that we can be pushed right back into the same kind of subprime lending that caused the financial crisis in 2007 and 2008. Oh, I hope you're wrong about that. Boy, well, we I got, hope I am we, too. We can't, but I don't we think can't so. withstand another hit like that. That was the, the, the devastation that created. You are absolutely right. We can't, and I hope we don't have to. But that that's, seems to be the clear intention of this new bureaucracy. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm going to hope that somebody like yourself gets in there that's a pragmatist and maybe straightens everybody out. We have to take our last break, but stay right where you are. We'll be right back with Pete Wilson. You're listening to the Costa Report. Fifty years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. But something you may not know is that Dr. King was represented by the world's foremost speaking agency, the American Program Bureau. The American Program Bureau has a courageous history of representing luminaries, entertainers, and motivators from all backgrounds. From Ronald Reagan, Richard Branson, and Mikhail Gorbachev to John Stewart, Michael Douglas, and Desmond Tutu. From A-list celebrities to best-selling authors, cutting-edge business leaders, and the greatest minds in academia, the American American Program Bureau has speakers to fit every venue and every budget. When corporations, conferences, schools, and community organizations need an expert speaker, they turn to the American Program Bureau to help them craft an event that will be remembered long afterwards. To inquire about a speaker for your next engagement, contact the American Program Bureau at 800-225-4575 or visit our website at apbspeakers.com. The American Program Bureau, making history one speech at a time. The best gifts I have ever received have been books. They're not expensive, and they don't use electricity, but they do offer hours of enjoyment. So do I have good news for you. The new paperback edition of The Watchman's Rattle is available in bookstores everywhere, including airports across the country. This is the only book to expose just how complicated our lives and governance has become. It not only explains the reasons for gridlock, but it also provides the answers. So pick up the new paperback edition of The Watchman's Rattle for a friend. The book Richard Branson says is a must read. And while you're at it, grab a copy for yourself. You'll be happy you did. Happy holidays from Goodwill Industries. Goodwill is in the business of changing lives through job training and employment services. Last year alone, we helped more than 12,000 job seekers on the Central Coast. Through the support of individuals like you, we can continue to meet the diverse needs of people in our community. We hope we can count on you as one of our supporters this holiday season. Please consider making a generous year-end gift of $35, $60, or $100, whatever amount is right for you. Please visit scgoodwill.org and click on the red Give button right now. Hi, this is Samantha Frankovich. And Nicole Lamb-Willis with the Salinas JCs reminding you our annual children's shopping tour is Saturday, December 14th at 7 a.m. at Northridge Mall. Each year, the Salinas JCs take over 400 local children shopping, outfitting them with basic necessities like shoes, clothing, and warm coats. We're still in need of cash donations and volunteers. Make a difference in a child's life as well as your own by volunteering. For more information, go to childrenshoppingtour.org or call 296-0774. That's 296-0774. Thank you. He worked out early, practiced late, and studied well into the night. 
The next day, he did it all over again. She missed time hanging out and socializing with friends so she could make it on time to practices and games. He became a top student and a confident leader, even as he helped his team win back-to-back -back conference titles. She became a role model in her community, even as she led her team to an undefeated season. And when they finished playing high school sports, what did they do next? She graduated from college with honors and went to work for a successful company. He attended graduate school and became a difference maker in his community. Because that's what student athletes in California do. They use the skills they develop playing high school sports today to do even bigger things in life tomorrow. High school sports. A winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. Take a moment to see Rebecca's video pick of the week. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Rebecca Costa YouTube channel. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Pete Wilson. And uh, I want to spend this last segment talking about a concept you developed called preventative government. Can you share with our listeners what that is and how we might use that principle on both a state and a federal level? Well, it's a fairly simple concept. The uh, concept is captured in the old bromide uh, that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. <laughs> yes. And there are all kinds of things that uh, it can apply to. Uh, it can apply certainly to education, which is critically important and an area in which we have fallen down terribly. I mean, it is. it has been the great American tradition that Education is the ladder of upward mobility, and poor children, given a decent education because of their inherent ability and drive, can become not only well off, but more importantly, real leaders in their community and in their nation. Let me ask you this, because it's something I've always wanted to ask a leader. Do we know how to educate our children anymore? Well, I think that we know several things. We know that the competition from children abroad uh, is reflecting that we are not doing the job properly. And I think the answer to that is that we need accountability on the part of individual classroom teachers. We are in California blessed with tens of thousands of skilled and dedicated professionals. But there are a great many more who don't reached the level that they should, and frankly, uh, we are paying a terrible price for it. And now, you instituted, is, if, I re, if I'm if i not uh, mistaken, you instituted mandatory testing in California, is that right? We restored it. We mm -hmm. restored statewide standardized testing that was aligned with more rigorous curricular standards, and we had a terrible fight with the teachers union yes. to get those standards adopted and an even more bitter fight about the legislation to restore standardized testing. But without it, no one really knows what the kids have learned, whether they are prepared to go on to the, do the work of the next grade. And we have seen the results of that manifested in what's called social promotion, which in its worst instances allows children to graduate from high school as virtually functional illiterates. Mm -hmm. unprepared for today's job market, and unprepared for responsible citizenship. Mm -hmm. So we need that kind of accountability, but frankly, the teachers' unions exist to defeat it. They are against merit pay. They are against testing. They are against the more rigorous curricular standards. They are against charter schools. And the result has been that we have gone from probably first in the nation 40 years ago in terms of the quality of public schools in California to now struggling not to be last. And that's not just a function of money because we have increased spending through the years. Mm -hmm. And the students that are doing the best are not necessarily those who have the highest per capita spending. But it's also the fact that the, the job environment itself is moving so fast. I think uh, Eric Schmidt said that we're generating as much information every 48 hours as we did from the dawn of humankind to year 2003. I mean, in an environment like that, 
education is one of the most challenging things that we we could face. And I think when you talk about preventative government, I think of it as preemptive government, the ability of leaders to look ahead and see where, what the consequences are of our actions right now and then to do something to, to you know, uh, avoid negative outcomes. Maybe I don't have that right, but that's how I, I saw you defining preventative government. Well, that is how we define it, and it has applications in a number of areas in terms of public safety. Mm-hmm. It has applications in terms uh, at the federal level in terms of national security. But we and seem it, so reactive this day, these days. We don't seem to be able to get out ahead of our problems. And well, that, to me, you know, is a real difference in, in leadership between I the agree. leadership we used to have and the leadership we have now. I, I could not agree more. I have just been... Uh, reading a couple of books about World War II and the collaboration between Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt and the steps that were necessary. Um, happily, we were the ones that gained an edge technologically by virtue of having that foresight and, and being fortunate in having the knowledge and foresight of people from Europe fleeing the Nazis who brought their expertise and allowed us uh, to gain the upper hand. And it also was uh, evident in our ability to come from woeful isolationism and unpreparedness to a position where we had so mobilized manpower as well as materiel. The materiel, I mean, the the equipment, uh, was it was astounding what was accomplished. I don't think we could do that today. Well, even after World War II, we had Ronald Reagan trying to uh, put together the Star Wars program to preempt uh, attacks and danger. Th- that, we, we've that, had that leaders that looked ahead and said, look it, we don't have to wait until danger is upon us. We can do I something can to preempt I can think of no better it. example. I can think of no better example. You're absolutely right. Unfortunately, the administration that succeeded him was one that dismantled the program for missile defense, anti-ballistic missile defense, that he had initiated. Mm -hmm. And God only knows what the costs can be, but we're still in a position where steps of that kind to dismantle rather than to move forward with the kind of research that is necessary and with the ability to adapt can be not just costly, but it could be fatally costly. Yes, absolutely. Now, uh, I don't want to let you go without asking you how folks can stay in touch with you. Do you have a website, or are you on social media? Uh, I am not. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, I won't make you. Uh, Do you have a website where they can keep track of what you're doing, or do you have a blog, something like that, that our listeners can go to? You know, I am busy enough right now so (laughs) that I have had to resist an invitation to blog and also... Um, we really don't have a website. Can I can purpose. I make a suggestion? Don't do it. Don't do it because it's a trap. Once you do it, you can't ever get off of it. And, well, uh, you know something? Uh, I I think that's good advice. It is and, good advice. Uh, I have a day job, as it is, trying to keep companies out of regulatory trouble. <laughs> and I also spend a good deal of my time as a trustee of the Reagan Presidential Foundation and for three years, was the chairman of the trustees of the National World War II Museum. And they call that retirement. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, Not exactly. (laughs) My wife says, well, no, he didn't flunk retirement. He just never enrolled. (laughs) Well, that is our program for today. But before we say goodbye, I do want to take a moment to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. It was my privilege and a pleasure to be with you today, Rebecca. Thanks. Thank you. Come back soon. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about today's program, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or send me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and let me know what you thought about our conversation with Pete Wilson today. And if you missed the full interview with Wilson or any of our other guests, you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, 
and our YouTube channel. See, I told you, once you get on this stuff, you can never get off of it. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank listeners who put the Watchman's Rattle on their Christmas list. And those of you who have taken a moment to order your copies, uh, we are fulfilling those orders just as fast as we can. And, and on behalf of the staff here at the Costa Report, I want to say that we appreciate your support. 100% of book proceeds go to keeping nonpartisan programming like the Costa Report on the air. So this is a gift you can truly feel good about. Besides which, uh, the, the Watchman's Rattle is the only book that spells out the three earliest signs to watch for prior to a unilateral collapse. And I want you, our listeners, to know what they are. So go to RebeccaCosta.com if you haven't done so yet and put in your book orders right now. Uh, do it while we still have free holiday shipping and you can get a customized dedication and autograph also at, at no additional cost. So go to Rebecca Costa, my name, R-E-B-E-C-C-A-C-O-S-T-A dot com. It'll take you less than three minutes, so don't wait. Do it right now. If your station is leaving us after this hour, next week we'll be continuing to look at the state of our nation's economy. My guest is popular financial pundit and CEO of Euro Pacific Capital, Mr. Peter Schiff. He'll be here to explain whether there's any real danger of America going bankrupt and what must be done to restore international confidence in our fiscal policy. Don't miss Peter Schiff next week right here on your favorite news program. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio following these important messages from our sponsors. You're listening to The Costa Report. 